Hi everybody, I'm Jordan Ostroff with Legalese Marketing and this is Exhibit A Attorneys where we interview attorneys and other experts around the country to talk about what it truly takes to be the Exhibit A of a successful lawyer. Today I get the benefit and honor of having somebody who checks a lot of those boxes. John Strohmeyer, an attorney, an expert, a great person, and also a fellow attorney with an actual personality. So for those of you that don't know John, he's the proprietor of Strohmeyer Law, PLLC in Houston. He assists individuals and their businesses with cross-border tax planning, estate planning, and estate administrations. He's board certified in, in both tax law and estate planning and, wait, hold on, tax law and estate planning and probate law as three things or as two it's things? It's two things. So tax okay. law, estate planning, and probate. Gotcha. By the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. I, in Florida, I don't even think you can be board certified in multiple things. Uh, I think you can. Um, I know other people who are. In Florida, I, 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 I'm pretty sure I've seen. Oh, interesting. Know, what, what do I know? It's, I'm allowed anyway. to be it, so whatever. <laughs> Let's waste more time on my certifications, dude. It's that's awesome though. Uh, John's also a fellow in the American College of Trust and Estate Council, ACTEC, the Cool Kids Club for Estate Planners, and uh, most importantly, at least for me, John hosts the Five Star Council podcast, where he blasts through the confusing and misleading advice about customer service telling us to follow Disney, Four Seasons, or Zappos for our law firms. Uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I enjoy slightly fewer than I listen to. John's is one that I listen to and enjoy. So if oh, you're not you. checking it out, he has hands down the best analogies that constantly make me stop and think about how I can apply them to my firm, my company, my life, everything. So I'm a huge fan of his podcast. Uh, Thank based... you. We're done here. Uh... That's it? That's all you wanted? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, just go listen to my podcast. No, 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 no. Jordan, we're he we're here to talk about our stuff, but I'm going to stop interrupting you. All right. Well, there's, I mean, you've only got four more paragraphs of wonderful things I can say about here. So, uh, but no, seriously, a lot of what John talks about is his career first working in the Four Seasons Hotels, uh, primarily as a night manager of the Austin property, where he had uh, several Tim Roth four room style run ins with different clients along those lines. He helps lawyers get better at client service, which helps them satisfy their ethical duties to their clients and convey their competence to those clients. 
He's also the chair of the International Tax Committee for the State Bar of Texas Tax Section. Tax Section was named Rookie of the Year by the Tax Section for the State Bar of Texas, was a 2015-2017 Fellow of the American Bar Association Section of Real Property Trust and Estate Law, and was a young leader of the American College of Trust and Estate Council. He uh, earned his BS in zoology from the University of Texas at Austin, spent four years working for the Four Seasons Hotel, uh, and then headed to law school. When not practicing law, he spends time with his wife, Emily, and their rescued mutts, Griswold, Molly, and Billy, who also uh, double as part of the HR team for Griswold. I don't know Molly and Billy's jobs at the firm. Um, Molly is our chief marketing officer, and Billy is the branch manager. There we go. Uh, John has run 44 marathons as of two months ago, homebrews his own beer, and writes about client ish service issues with professionals. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Jordan. It's great to be here. I have run one marathon in my life, and it was the worst decision I have ever made. So the fact that you have done 43 more after that first one, I am even more impressed by you. Uh, you know, it's something that I enjoy and I don't expect anybody else to enjoy. My wife has never run one. She will never do anything longer than a 10K, and that is just fine. Like, I, it is not a measuring stick I use to judge anybody. It's just my own little personal, uh, you know, this is what I do a lot of. So my wife and I ran the marathon, I want to say like six days after we got married. We had booked the marathon like way before we got engaged, and it just so happened to coincide um, I ran a 2.20 first half, ran a 3.30 nice. second half, and literally could not run across the finish line. And then for like a week later, I could not move at a legitimate speed and had to like lower myself onto the ground to pick things up. Like it was just a miserable experience. So props uh, to I mean, it's, Yeah, that sounds like a normal first time through. Does it, it get, I guess, I assume it gets easier. It does. Uh, you you are, you end up learning. You know, like the more you train, the better you get. I've had some marathons where I'm literally not sore the next day. That's fantastic, man. Good for yes. you. Thank you. All right. So today with John, we're going to talk about the top ways to perfect your customer service. But before that, I want to highlight our previous episode. That was the Modern Lawyer with Brad Miller. Brad talked to us about how to be adaptable client focused and forward thinking really great chat. Cause then Brad tied it up into that's what it takes to become the modern lawyer. So once you're done listening to the wonderful words of wisdom from John, if you want to listen to more of our great episodes, I would suggest go back to that. That aired on Thursday. Today is Monday. I say that as a compliment. It didn't, it doesn't feel like Monday. And again, I say that as a compliment. So enough about that though, the top ways to, to perfect your customer service. So John, at its core, when we're talking about customer service, what does that truly mean from a law firm perspective? So that is a great question and a great place to start. We as lawyers get lumped in with the service industry. And so people think, oh, well, you're service industry. So you're like doctors and accountants and engineers and Disney and Four Seasons and Ritz Carlton and restaurants and all the rest of it. And we're not, you know, we're, we're differentiated from, you know, tangible goods. We're not selling people a thing, but we need to make sure that we understand there's a big difference in doctors, lawyers, accountants, and Disney Four Seasons level of service. They're so different. I, yeah. So I want to, I just want to jump in there for one second. So you're talking about the professional services being different from the non-professional service? I don't know what the other word would be. So I break it down into, you know, every business is primarily one of three things. It's either a physical business, like they're selling you a thing. They may, you know, sell, they may rent it. So the gym, primarily they're there to give you access to a thing. Then there are what I will call technical service businesses or technical businesses. So lawyers, we're here to provide a technical service, or apply the law, doctors, apply medical knowledge, CPAs, apply accounting information, barbers, apply the skill, you know, move the needle for a client on a specific thing, you know, bring, bring in your ability to do a thing. Then the last, restaurants, 
Four Seasons Disney. These are what I'd call service businesses. And the way to differentiate is they're Disney Four Seasons restaurants. They're all selling a combination of entertainment, pampering, or fun. You know, if you had a free Saturday, you might go to that service business. If you had a free Saturday, you're not calling your doctor, your lawyer, or your accountant. You may call your your barber, but really, you know, for for this right now, you're hiring your, you know, those technical service providers to move a needle for you. And that's a huge difference. And we want to make sure that, you know, you've got to be focused in on that because what works for Disney Four Seasons in restaurants doesn't work for us because people aren't coming to us for entertainment, pampering, and fun. Makes perfect sense. So so are you, I mean, I guess you're including all the technical service along there. So it's not necessarily a true professional service difference. There is still though that component of personal knowledge that you are applying to the problem that the client, customer, patient has. Right. It, it's, it doesn't require that you have any specific professional degree, though professional degrees do end up there. I would even lump Amazon in with technical services. Their job, you know, you might think, well, John, they're just selling you stuff. Actually not. They're a logistics company. Their job is to get stuff from the manufacturer to you as quickly as possible and as easily as possible. And so they're focused on, I mean, they're just laser focused on how do we make it fast and easy for you to get stuff? How do you move the needle from having zero amount of a thing to having exactly as much of a thing as you want to have? So, I mean, I guess this is going to go slightly off base, but then where do you put like Costco in there? Because Costco has a very different model as well than the traditional store Right. And, and, you know, Costco and Walmart and Amazon are all kind of existing, you know, the, the point we, we could spend all the time in the world, but they're going to be somewhere between professional or in a physical services and technical, depending on how you're going to think of it. And the real, you know, their job is to get the stuff to you. You're paying for access to the stuff. So there's kind of, two high levels of components and how much the logistics chain that goes there and what they're doing, they're enabling you to get the stuff. And it's important, you know, Costco, they're there. I I put Costco more in the technical service just because they are getting you the stuff versus Lego. They do care. They do have some downstream delivery, but ultimately they're melting the plastic and putting it into the fun shapes and putting it in a box for you. So you talk about moving the needle. And I think before we get into the rest of this chat, I think it's important for us to help everybody listening or watching figure out what needle they truly need to move or or being hired to move. So how does a lawyer figure that out from your perspective? Right. So what clients don't want, let's start with that. They're not coming to us because they looked in the fridge and they saw, oh, I need a gallon of legal. They are, I need 15 billable hours applied to my problem. Now they're saying, I have this issue. It's I'm divorced and I'm, or I'm married and I need to be divorced. I would like to adopt a child. I'm in jail and I would like to get out. I have been injured and I would like to get recovery for that. I have an estate. I would like to plan for it. So there's not a mess. It's not always going to be obvious. I think uh, personal injury lawyers and Jordan, as as one, you can tell me more. And I'll let you tell me about this, but folks come to personal injury attorneys not just because, you know, it's, yes, there is a payday of sorts, but ultimately they're trying to get their life back. They're trying to get recovery for their life. Usually that takes the form of cash, but there might be times where you're saying, well, look, you know, this isn't a cash payout, but we can get you, you know, X, Y, Z that enables you to get your life back. You know, whether it's build, you know, installing uh, whatever improvements in your house that'll make things better or getting you the right car. People are looking to achieve some specific result. And it's not just, oh, I had some attorney think about my problem for 15 minute stretches. And then we, then he sent me a bill. Yeah. So 
it's interesting because you know you talk about personal injury being specific in that manner i always sort of look at it as our niche is that we are not solely focused on the amount of money we are so we are focused on what that means for them and what it is um but it's interesting because when you talk about that needle moving we're not talking we're not necessarily talking about your specific niche your unique selling proposition really we are talking about the core legal function type case that you are handling right okay. and it's how do you convey to your potential clients this is what we're going to help you do all right so we've got we've got the right needle in mind so now the perfecting that customer service is how we move that needle in the nicest way possible in the most customer centric way possible in the what's the what's the connection what's there? next well ultimately it's how do we make it easy for everybody involved and that that's kind of a really generic way but you've got to think about it as it's not just client centric because of the you know the three groups involved in any representation we've got you know employ the clients we've got the law firm's employees and then we've got also, you know, the HR staff in the background that's yelling about the murderers outside my door. Uh, no, we've got the owners of the law firm. So three groups forming this kind of stool that put together, what are we doing? We're trying to deliver this result. Everybody's should be pulling for that same direction. Let's move the needle for clients. So when we look at clients, I don't like being customer centric. And it's not because I don't think they're important. It's that clients are the most you know, the, the most likely to change, you know, the clients I'm working with right now, it's a different mix of people than I'll be working with six months from now and this time next year. So you have to recognize that the clients are going to change, but you've got to take care of your people because those are the ones who are going to be here. A lot of my staff have been with me for multiple years. And so I want to make sure I'm taking care of them. And so the things that I'm asking that they do in service of the client and in terms of making it easy for my clients, they've got to be willing and able to do. It doesn't mean, look, if they don't want to do it, I'll just say, okay, well, uh, we're not going to do it. But you do have to hear them out and say, well, is this reasonable or are we just doing something that's showy for a client that doesn't help the client move the needle, difficult for the employees, expensive, burdensome, headache creating for owners kind of looking at it through those three lenses to see yeah, does this make sense i love the uh, the concept of that stool there was a, a really wise dude who i should have on the show who talked about like the owner being a full leg the employees being like you know a series of sticks that are still decent size but bandy together and then the clients i believe were a bunch of toothpicks put together because they are you know moving in and out so much quicker jordan who was that do you remember who that was i should I, probably go on his show too I have no idea. No, that was uh, that was John for anybody that doesn't get sarcasm. So, okay, so we're not talking about being client centric. We are talking about the what covers the needs of those three legs of the stool equally in the most effective manner for the business. Like, what's the what's the balancing test? It, I mean, it's it's going to depend. Lawyer answer. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to do things that make easier sense for your employees that look, you know, we're not going to start from a blank piece of paper when we draft any document. Why? It's going to make it more difficult for the employees. We want to make it easy for them. Clients aren't going to know the difference. Uh, owners are going to like the fact that, hey, we're not wasting time starting with a blank document every time. Well, and clients should appreciate either it's going to be cheaper, it's going to be faster or both. Exactly. And what else we're looking for this to be consistent we want to make sure that you know how we show up on tuesday is the same as how we show up on friday sh same as how we show up the next monday we want to take care of clients the same way why the more you do something the more you do it the same way the easier it's going to get now every client's going to be different and i'm not saying every client needs to be you know fit into one stamp but there's a certain amount of flexibility you're going to know well look you know, for planning an estate, yes, the documents are the documents. Clients, though, don't care if they get a will or a trust or the singing bush that just tells people what to do. They want to know, ultimately, the needle they're trying to move is when they pass, things are not going to be a mess. They want to know, you know, 
there are different variations on this, but take care of the kids, take care of my spouse, avoid fights, not lose my assets, don't pay too much in tax. There are different variations and everybody's got their version of it. And so you're setting up systems so that when you're going through, like, have we made sure that we've always ticked off all the right things? You know, or are we asking all the important questions up front? Do we know what those questions are so that we can verify and kind of see where this person is? I mean, I think back to when I was at the hotel, I was working front desk for my four years there. I worked uh, line staff, front desk agent for the first year, and then I was night manager for the last three. When you checked in, there were 21 things you had to do every time you checked somebody in. Now, it's not... You know, and we had a checklist for it and it was meant to say, all right, this person's coming to our hotel. They may never have been to this particular hotel before. We don't know how they got here, kind of what condition they're in. We'll obviously kind of be able to look at them and see, okay, well, they're fine or they need some extra help. But here are the things we want to make sure they have. Here's, here's how you get to the elevators. Here's where food is available right now. Here are some other things you may be looking for in the hotel and just make sure they're kind of welcomed in and kind of handed off to the rest of the hotel to get what they need. And so it's easy for them. On the flip side, when they were checking out, it's like 13 things that we had to do. Why? Well, if they're leaving, we don't need to control for as much. They've been with us for at least a night, if not two or three. So we're less concerned with making sure they know where to eat in the hotel because most people no, you know, like if, if they're checking out, they're either heading directly to a meal or they've just come from one. They may want, if they're hungry, they generally will ask. But we do want to make sure we've taken care of their transportation. Do we need to call your car around? Do we need to call a, a cab? And kind of thinking through, all right, every time we want to make sure this, you know, 95% of the people who are checking out are going to have some of these issues. So how do we address them knowing what we know? So I guess what that triggers for me is if somebody is either has not yet set up their firm or is very much at the beginning of creating this, you know, customer service journey, is the advice you're going to give them different than somebody who's been going through it and is making those changes and tweaks to make it better and better? Absolutely. Because you do, I mean, you're focused on different things and the firm that I run now is not only bigger and making more money than it was when I opened it in 2018, but we just, we deal with slightly different clients. Like I'm, I'm doing different things. The product is better because we refine it and we're asking better questions. And, you know, this is after I'd already been board certified in both tax and estate planning for years, but just realizing, oh, wait a minute. If I just always look for those little 1% changes, how can we make it easier here and there? And you do want to be focused on different things at different points in when you're building things out. Why? You don't want to start spending on expensive, risky things early on. You want to be focused on kind of the lowest hanging fruit when you're right out of, when you're coming right out. Why? It, that's what you can afford. You don't want to go all in on a $500 a day PPC uh, commitment if you're just starting out, like you don't have that level of margin, you've got to be looking for kind of the easy wins, the things that you can do that will make your life easier. If you've got staff, when you're right out, make their life easier, take care of your clients better and really demonstrate you, you know what you're doing. Your clients can trust what you're doing and everybody can work together and get that best result. So putting together that, you know, the lawyer version of that 21 point checklist or workflows or something like that, so you've got consistency, I mean, maybe the best use of time at the beginning from that customer service standpoint. It, it's, you know, it's going to depend on what you're doing, what you want to think about, you know, the client journey, knowing what do you have to do? Because the more you can say, all right, client, we're going to do this, you know, we're going to play in your estate. That means we need to sit down and talk about things. We need to go through this and job one, we're going to get information about you. Job two, we're going to come up with your plan. We're not going to draft documents yet. We're going to come up with your plan. Once you like that plan, that's when we'll draft documents. Uh, same with litigation. 
And again, this is where I'm going to show I'm not a litigator. I don't want to be one. Uh, but you'll have, you know, some version of, look, we're going to do our due diligence. We're going to exchange discovery. We'll have some initial motions, then maybe oral arguments, maybe not. Who, you know, maybe it's all submitted. But showing to clients, like, here's the road roadmap. Like, the, you're going to work with your client to set whatever the goal is, whatever your mountaintop for the client, you know, this is what it looks like when we've moved the needle. When we've climbed the mountain together, this is what it will look like. And then you're saying, this is how we get there. These are the steps. And so the clients know, you know, we, we don't need them to be experts in what we do, but they should have an understanding, you know, even in very gross terms of what we're doing. And so they can, you know, so we can have conversations with them. And it's amazing to me because like, obviously, look, rule number one, don't lie to clients. But <laughs> that being said, like a lot of what you're telling them is you sort of crafting the expectations from them from whole cloth or from, you know, wet clay, because they don't necessarily have something in mind about what this process is going to look like. Um, and so again, don't lie to your clients, but ultimately like you are telling them to expect what you're going to do for them that you've done for thousands of other clients. Right. And I mean, that's, that's where it gets really easy for clients to take kind of a fast food mentality, especially to what I do. Like, oh, you know, I, I heard I need a will. All right. That's a document. You're just going to put my name in there and then we're done. Why am I paying anything more than $5 for this? Well, there's a lot that goes into it. And the idea is that we, you know, you want to show clients that you've got the requisite knowledge. You know what you're talking about. Uh, it's something that I've talked about before. I don't think we got into it, but the idea of being a replacement level lawyer, you know, if anybody could show up and do what you do, it's going to be harder for you to stand out and really justify higher prices. And it, that's regardless of your chosen practice area. Like it just, if you're not the expert, if you're not on the way there, it's going to make things more difficult. And I think that's where it comes in, like the content marketing, getting on YouTube and uh, showing off what you know, it makes it a lot easier to say, oh, this is the guy for me. Yeah, I know we have, um, so before we file suit on an API case, we always have our clients go through the standard interrogatories and that slows down the process a little bit. But from our perspective, it, it gets us ready for litigation a lot better. And sometimes there'll be some interesting answers that we can use pre-suit to try and get, you know, whatever the five, 10, $15,000 difference is. Um, and so it's always interesting to kind of preemptively talk to clients about what to expect in that manner, because there's a bunch of other attorneys that will say differently that aren't necessarily wrong. We have just found, we prefer this. This is the right way for us, I guess. That That's interesting. Now, like two things I want to key off of there. One it sounds like you have your list of 10, 15, 30 questions you're posing to your client. Just I mean, one, getting them ready probably to get deposed, if nothing else. And I mean, so you, you're, you're kind of nodding along the, for the folks on the podcast. I mean, it, that's a, you're getting them ready. And it's not just a, let's make sure you've answered this, but you know, you're going to hold their hand through this and know, look, I'm on your side, but I have to press you on these questions to get you ready. Certainly. Yeah. And I mean, that's important. Like, Hey, just so you know, there's a lawyer from the other side who's going to do his best to metaphorically beat you up. We're going to practice once. But the other side of it is if you've got these standard questions, you're figuring out, you know, the fat part of that bell curve, you can get rid of a lot of problems based on whatever those questions are. And it doesn't mean you don't have other questions that follow on. Oh, he said blue. That That's a weird answer. Let's follow up on that. And maybe you add, you know, that's question 31 for next time. And so it's important to kind of make sure your client knows, knows what they're going to get into. You're getting them prepped for the harder part. But you're also making sure that you're running down the normal course of things to make sure you don't get yourself in an odd spot. It's like, oh, you know, like how bad would it be if you got down the line and one of the questions you should have been asking ends up biting you in the bottom later. I mean, I, you know, just thinking about Texas law, 
you can't be appointed as an executor or an administrator of an estate if you if you have ever been convicted of a felony. Like it's just a blanket bar. There's no way around it. This means when we're talking to clients about probate, we know we have to ask them, are you a convicted felon? And most of my clients, if I don't prep it with, I'm sorry, I have to ask you this. And it says nothing about anything you've said to me or how you've presented. I just have to make sure you're not a convicted felon um, because occasionally it has shown up where potential clients are convicted felons. And if we don't ask them, that gets very awkward later on. And, and how many of them have challenged you to a duel? <laughs> no, I, so it's such a great point. I mean, and, and so when we're talking about the top ways to perfect your customer service, it sounds like a huge part of this is really running through it with clients over and over again and making those small tweaks. Right. I mean, think about it. The job is to make it easy for them to move the needle. That like that, that might be the clearest distillation I can put of it. For a client who is a felon, who wants to be executor, they don't necessarily want to be executor to be executor. They're trying to clean up mom or dad's estate and they need to get there as soon as possible. And so if we come in and we for, forget, don't just neglect asking if they're a felon, we're going to set a court date, we're going to show up on Zoom, and then we're going to get to the, hey, are you a convicted felon? Like, yep, sure am. And the judge is going to say, well, I can't, you know, Mr. Strohmeyer, we can't appoint this person. And we're going to have to reset. We're going to push it back everything a few more weeks. That's not a good result. You know, down the line, sure, somebody will get appointed. But not wouldn't me. it be better to say, look, you know, really sorry, Ed, you know, because you're a convicted felon, there's nothing I can do about it. You know, would your brother do it? Could your kid do it? Can we get somebody to agree on this? And that's, you know, that that's there to make it easy for them. So what are some of the other ways to perfect that customer service or to move that needle in the easiest manner? I mean, it, it sounds like the specifics of it are going to be different for every firm and every practice area, but what's sort of that methodology behind it that allows us to figure out what the tactic is for us? It's going to be, you know, again, just looking at what are the client looking to do in any given instance, you know, broad terms, clients are coming in for me to plan their estate. We can think about what that looks like broad term, but when we were having meetings in real life, well, clients are going to come in to my office. They're going to sit at a table and we're going to talk for an hour or two. And then we're going to make some decisions and they're going to leave. Clients aren't just kind of empty vessels accepting knowledge. Good clients do want to take notes. And so recognizing, all right, clients are going to come in. We want to show that we are We've done this before, so we're prepared and ready for them. What have we done to get them ready? So I you know I now send what I call homework. I tell clients, read this, and you can shave about an hour off that meeting. You know, I'll do my best to be entertaining, but really, you're looking to have this done. And if we cannot sit in an office, you know, in a conference room for two and a half or three hours, you're probably going to be fine with that. You know, if I can make that shorter. But how can I recognize that I know you were coming in? Well. Think about it as if you were going to a restaurant. If you called up and you know you and your wife were going out for anniversary dinner and you called a restaurant to make that reservation and they said, of course, Mr. Ostroff, we're looking forward to seeing you and your wife, uh, just the two of you for dinner in a few weeks. You show up and they you know, we've got the reservation right here. Follow me. There are a couple ways that table could be set up for you. It could be Four, you know, a squared four top table with four place settings, nothing there to say it was reserved, you know, no flowers, nothing else like that, just regular four top. And the second they sit you down, they kind of take away the extra two sets. Or they could take you to a table that's still the same four top table, but it has two settings. Maybe it's got a single rose, you know, whatever it is, but little tiny touches like having exactly the number of place settings for the people who are expected show that you were expected. It wasn't like, oh, here's this table. We'll give it to them. It's, they were coming. This was special. We knew you know, it's your anniversary. So we got ready for that. But see, John, then right. that goes back to the disagreement we have all the time online about the, you know, having the latte, having their favorite drink, you know, like what, what's the, obviously they're not coming to you for the favorite drink, but 
right. I'm not necessarily going to that restaurant because they have a, a four top set for two, but it is that extra little touch that gives me the warm fuzzies, if you will. Right. And so here's where we need to think about it. one. You're going to the restaurant for combination of pampering entertainment and fun. You're not going to the lawyer's office for that. Well, John, how do we convey some of that quickly and easily? Look, if somebody's going to come into your conference room and be there, this, this, the small touch you have, one notepad and one pen ready to go for everybody who's going to be at the meeting. Sh you know, just showing, look, we knew you were coming. You know, not only is the table not littered with dishes from the previous meeting, we knew you were coming in. We also, you know, depending on what you're doing, we we may have your documents ready to go for you to sign. Uh, when I've got clients who come in, you know, husband and wife, we've got two sets of documents and I use the plastic uh, colored paper clips. And so we've got different colors for each person. One to signal gently who sits where, but also I know, okay, well, blue paper clips for the husband, uh, pink for the, for the wife. And it just makes it easy for everybody. And it also makes it easy for my staff because they know, okay, well, when we're doing this, husband gets blue paper clips and everybody knows that's how it is. And it ultimately doesn't cost us anything. So in terms of those little tiny things, what we're not talking about is big cost intensive investments in, you know, Latte Master 9000, because again, clients aren't going to show up for to your office for Latte Master 9000. Like you're just not going to be good at it. You're not, you don't want to divert people from that. But there are small things you can do to recognize who your clients are. And the service part I want people thinking about is how does it help clients move the needle? If it's helping move their needle, move a needle for the client, then yeah, that's part of service. Look into how you can do that. You know, what are the ways you can make that easy? How do you, how can you convey your expertise? The fact that you've, you are the expert guide on all of this. So are you, I guess for me, the question becomes this, like, are you against Latte Master 9000 or are you against that before you have the right color paper clips, before you have, you know, the right employees fulfilling the work in a timely manner? The, you know, like, is it, is it the thing in theory or is it prioritizing that thing over the better needle movers? It's, it's all priority. And okay. I get, I get very, you know, it's like just frustrated when I see people like, oh, you've got to spend all this money on this to lawyers who may not have things, you know, in line and clicking on multiple cylinders at once. Like there is a priority, you know, you want to start by focusing on, you know, the first things you're going to do, make sure your people and your basic knowledge of the law are in place. Like long before you care about paper clips, you have to be focused on the right people working for you, making sure they know what they're doing. You know, if, if you're an estate planner and you're, you've never done it before, but long before you figure out gifting programs or lattes or paper clips, you need to know what to look for when planning an estate. And that's just like, that's your basic duty to the bar. So, Correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds like almost a three-step process of like the legal knowledge, getting the legal knowledge experience to the client. And then finally that last step is once you've nailed two and three, then you can put on the extra little frills. Right. And it's, it's all kind of measured steps because you're not going to go, you know, you shouldn't be blowing your profit margin on gifting programs or the latte master if it doesn't matter, you know, I've learned over the years and, you know, especially over the last year and a half when clients haven't shown up, my clients really don't care if we have anything other than water or black coffee available. And most of them, they just don't. Now it helps that I've got a coffee. Uh, there's a coffee shop that I like, you know, it's pretty decent uh, on the first floor of my building. So if they really want something, I don't have to worry about it. We can just walk downstairs and I'll probably get something for myself at the same time. It's focusing our efforts on what actually drives things for the clients. So you're right, like we've got to focus on our knowledge. How do we better deliver for the clients uh, you know, than getting better skills 
and you know becoming that legal expert that people are going to come to then you can come in and say oh, okay well now we've got the the better coffee that's easy enough for us to do you don't want to divert somebody who's got a who's not already a part-time barista into being a part-time barista if they can be helping other clients and it's yeah, see yeah. and i like i like the not the flip side but i like the double dip you know, I like the, so you've got, you know, three to five employees, what's their favorite drink? What's their favorite coffee? What are their favorite snacks? What are their favorite, you know, little extras that they would like? And then you stack the office with those things and you have better employee morale and you offer the same thing to clients and, you know, you get the potential to have those little frills for a client here and there, but ultimately you're also in theory, creating a better workplace for those employees every day. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, and I would, even agree that you know the service you provide to your clients, it's just a reflection on what you should be doing to your employees. You know, it's management is just service for the people who work for you. And how do you make their jobs easy? How do you make it effective for them? Well, I also think the the happier your staff are, the better their interactions are with clients, or the better their work product is that then goes before the client. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to take care of people, and you know looking at it now you know we've been in the office two days a week for the last eight nine months we've got you know there are things we do and there are also things where it's like look you can you can have pay raise or we can have uh frillier stuff in the office and there are some things that i do you know for the folks who are working in the office for the last year it hasn't been a big deal to offer look i'll cover lunch it's just easy yeah and it's and like the more that you make that customized to each person, or at least the more you hear everybody's input, the more you are empowering them to provide that same feedback on the documents that go to clients, the systems that back the legal work. I mean, there's, there's a huge culture, I don't want to say shift, but there's a, there's a cohesive genuineness to the culture of feedback when you are doing it on those little things, it snowballs in a good way into the bigger things. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, and it all starts with making sure you're getting the right people in the front door to work for you. And also, you know, like that ends up reflecting on the people who come through the, the front door to be your clients. You know, you, you'd mentioned that my dogs are listed on my website and that's one of those marketing, I think it's a shibboleth, I don't know. It, but it's the people who come in, I regularly get one or so new clients every month who are saying, well, we weren't sure we were thinking about you and somebody else. And then we saw your dogs on your website, or we stopped looking because we saw your dogs on your website. And we knew you were the guy for us. And so, I mean, like I had one client uh, this year who literally sent it to all of her kids. Like, I can't believe we got this. <laughs> and, you know, and then the sent it back to me just to make sure they knew or that I knew that they had sent it on. And, Please, hold this on, before you go on, please, dear God, for the people in the back, once again, like literally there are clients that are deciding to go with you because you have put the somewhat of a personality on your website. Yep. yep. Amazing. I, I have, I have my three dogs listed as employees. They're my bark office and they're all there because it does show who they are. You know, like those are, they're my dogs. I want them out there. And for those of you thinking, John, like if I just put some dogs on there, I don't, you know, I don't like dogs. Fine, put your cats, but whatever is important to you. You know, for those of you watching along, hey, I've got my Lego collection in part behind me. Why? It shows some personality. And so I've had, I've had Lego conversations with clients because they thought it was interesting and that's fine. And, and but the flip side of it is for as many people who are saying we are going with you because of this, there are just as many, if not possibly more people are saying, this guy isn't serious, I'm going somewhere else, or this isn't the person for me. And I'm helping make it easy for those clients to figure out I'm a good fit for them. And the ones who don't like that, that's fine. You know, like if they were, if they don't think I'm serious because I have my dogs on my website, they are allowed to think that they can go elsewhere, you know, like there are no shortage of options for folks out there. I don't, you know, I've, I've made it easy for them to see I'm not their right fit. 
But and if you great. don't do that, then those are the 20% of clients that take up age and the time where your staff feels like they're swimming upstream, where you dread yep. every phone call, yada, right. yada, yada. Right. I mean, and like, what's the purpose, you know, the difference between marketing and sales or, you know, marketing, we're trying to make it easy for people to see we can help them and we are the people to help them. And then we go into sales and it's like, how, can, how easily can we make them our clients and make it easy for them to become our clients? We, if people aren't going to be a fit, you know, if they're not a qualified lead for us, we shouldn't be focusing our time and effort on them. And there are multiple ways you can qualify. It's not just, have they been injured in this way? Do they have a problem we can solve? It's, can we deal with them? Do we, is this the sort of person we want to work with? And that's where happiness lies. It lies yes. by having that authenticity and the genuineness the entire way through the marketing process, the sales process, the fulfillment process, the retention process. Um, love it. Huge, huge proponent of that. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, kind of going back to it, it's, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not for utilitarian, you know, one ply toilet paper, uh, the cheapest big pens you can find, find things that make sense and what actually makes it easier for your clients. You know, my, I've just figured out for my estate planning clients, none of them care if we use heavyweight bond paper. And I was happy to not spend money on that as the business owner, because I saw that stuff is like two and $3 a page. When you're writing wills and trust agreements that are 30 and 40 pages long, that doesn't make any sense. Like I, I got over that real quick. Makes perfect but, sense. Right. And, and like clients don't care. Like their will is just as valid if it's on, you know, 300 weight bond paper, you know, 8,000 thread count Egyptian cotton sheets or copy paper. Well, and I think in this day and age, people would also rather have like a flash drive with a digital copy or a Google drive access or, you know, something along those lines. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, they, they still have to, like our clients get digital access later on there, but they still have to sign physical documents with, you know, wet ink. Right. Makes perfect sense. All right. So as we get towards the end, um, anything else that we need to cover, anything I cut you off on, anything else that you want to share with our listener watchers here? Oh my goodness. So we talked a little bit about gifting online before, and we've got a few minutes. I, I'd put it back here to say clients aren't coming to you for stuff. Clients are coming to you to help move the needle on some issue in their life. So it doesn't mean no stuff. It means make sure that what you're giving them aligns with helping them solve that problem, helping them move that needle. So just the broad, oh, well, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to send everybody cut, uh, Cutco knives. I'm going to send everybody Tiffany uh, bracelet. Unless that really makes sense for who they are and what they do, you're, you, you know, you're spending a great deal on your marketing budget, but that's not coming out of your delivery. So make sure it's focused. Uh, a few months ago, I, there was, I forget where it was online, but there was a discussion of one PI attorney who is focused on clients who they come in before they've gone to surgery. And so she's sending get well soon kind of post recovery or post surgery recovery care packages. It's like, that's great. That makes sense The you know, it kind of lines up with they're there to recover there. You know, and so the law firm is helping their clients recover by speeding up their recovery at home. Like here are a few meals, you know, kind of whatever goes into that care package. That's great. What they didn't send is like, here's the engraved uh, coaster set that we got from anypromo.com. That's just a thing with our, you know, like, hey, thanks for using a Johnson uh, law firm to assist you in your re recovery. Like, okay, well, we don't get ring marks on the desk. Yeah, and I think that's that just me recover. And I think that's such a strong point because, like, if you're doing stuff to client, if you're giving stuff to clients it needs to be stuff that makes sense in the context of the case, or it needs to be things that are of high value to the client because of a specific connection you all have made. So, you know, if somebody comes in, they love that you had the dogs on, they talk about their dogs, you know, hooking them up with a, a Chewy's uh, subscription or something like that as a client appreciation gift makes a lot more sense than just deciding for some random stuff in the either. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's gifts 
gifts are such a fraught topic because we just destroy value when we go buy something for somebody we don't know if they like it or not you know how do you know look everybody loves yeti things but i, I also know i've got a cabinet with about 15 of them that we use on any given week four of them you know, and so like now we've got all of these do we need if we got one more i literally don't know if i'd keep it yeah you know, we no, might but... cycle one out so that yeah it's just like make sure you know why you're getting something for somebody and it's if it's a well everybody likes these sure but how do you know the people you're getting it to don't already have 15 of them no perfect i totally agree and i you know so for so for example for anybody listening you know people doing the um, trust and estate planning like john you know maybe getting them a really nice like fireproof safe or something like that like that may be something that has value in the context of your deliverable as something you know helpful to them and obviously same pi recovery um something along those lines so either make sure that it is definitively necessary or potentially needed as part of the service or make sure it's something they actually like and want otherwise i totally agree with you i'm, I'm a big fan of don't waste don't waste time don't waste money don't waste the relationship whatever it's going to be great all right so um as we're going up here on time our next episode will air Breezy, I want to say not Thursday, right? Next Monday. Okay. So there will not be an episode this Thursday. So our next episode starts on next Monday, 1.30 Eastern time. We're going to have Dan Lear on. For those of you that don't know, Dan works with Gravity Payments, uh, Gravity Legal, I should say, coming out of Gravity Payments. He's going to talk about improving money management and accelerating your law firm's growth. Uh, very interesting background that Dan has. Very interesting stuff that they're, that his company is putting together now, really trying to get the best and easiest way for us to make money or us to get paid from our clients. And so very interested to hear a lot of his insight. That will be next Monday, no episode Thursday, next Monday, 1.30 Eastern time. But John, before I let you go, I need that diamond nugget of wisdom. So if somebody's been listening to this for the last 50 minutes or so, they remember absolutely nothing you said except what you share here. It can be something we've already talked about. It can be something totally different. But what would be the biggest piece of advice that you want to give lawyers so that they can be the exhibit A of a successful attorney? I'm going to go back to the thing that I started out with. Lawyers are hired to move the needle on a specific problem. We're not here for some combination of entertainment, pampering, and fun. It doesn't mean we can't pick up lessons from Disney and Four Seasons, but you've got to be focused on how do you make it easy for clients to resolve their particular problems. And so when you start following that, you're not going to get distracted by the trends saying, oh, well, you know, you've got to have this gifting program or you've got to give clients this or that. It's focus on solving their problems and making it easy for them to do that. And you're going to find the easier service hits there. And I have legitimately never had a conversation with somebody that was very clear on what needle they moved, very clear on who their ideal client was, very clear on what they actually sold, who was not successful. Like that is a very consistent thing across everyone I've talked to who I am consistently enamored by is they understand those things because you're right. Like those are the things you have to have first because then every decision afterwards is, is that cohesive and genuine with the needle, the ideal client, the what we actually sell? And when it's not, those are the easy things to say no to or at least say not yet to. Um, while you focus on the things that really impact that needle. Exactly. Yeah, it's just, it doesn't mean you can't get there, but get the basics down first. And there's a progression. Every, you know, every firm's going to be different. Just make it work for you and your firm. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, before I let you go, we've got your we've got strohmeyerlaw.com we've got fivestarcouncil.com we've got at john the lawyer your twitter we've got at strohmeyerlaw pllc on instagram we've got at five star council on instagram we've got your linkedin and we've got your law firm's linkedin any other contact information you want to make sure that we share with anybody listening or watching well uh, we want to make sure we share the link to your episode with me from last friday because obviously your listeners love you so here's a little bit more jordan for you there we go. All right, Breezy, I will make sure that we get that up. Do you have that? Or I may have just emailed that to Brett last week, Breezy. Okay, I'll pull that up and get that in the comments right now. All right. Thanks so much, John. Of course. Thanks for having me.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Exhibit A Attorneys. If you're interested in becoming the Exhibit A of Successful Attorney, please check us out at LegalEaseMarketing.com, E-A-S-E.